if you, you don't know me and you've never sat with me, if I'm ever on my laptop, the back of it has this little logo on the back. It's about little, like this big. It's tiny. You can't really see it very obvious. It's only this big. You guys are getting the picture, right? It's intentional. It says radical manhood on the back, whether it's a coffee shop or wherever. It's a conversation starter. And when you're in uh, places where there's predominantly men hunting for four weeks, you get to have a lot of, what does that mean, conversations? Well, let me tell you, funny that you ask. I don't know how you happen to pick it up from that little sticker. I want us to understand this morning the intentionality of God in your life. And in this morning, as we look at the specific topic, love, sexuality, and a call through purity. Right now, half of you guys just flashed back to your junior high days, and you're thinking, do we really have to have this topic, right? But what I want you and I to understand this morning, it's not a topic about love and sexuality and impurity. It's understanding who we are really before the face of God. And to get there, let me read you all of the text for this morning. It's going to take a few minutes. I would encourage you, if you want to follow along, you may. It's Romans 1, 18 through 32. There won't be a slide. There's too much for that. And it is uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 19. I ask you to listen as if you are dirty and you're going to take a shower and you step into the warm shower and you watch the filth run off of you. You've all maybe been that dirty at times. You like look at the floor of the shower and you're like, gross. May this word wash over you as we hear it. It says this in Romans 1, 18-32, God's wrath on unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. And the things that had been made, so they were without excuse. They meaning the seers of those things. Verse 21. For although they knew God, they did not honor God or honor Him as God or give thanks to Him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Let it wash. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creepy things. There's a conjunction tying these two thoughts together. Therefore, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served creature rather than creator who is blessed forever. Amen? Do we agree with that? Yeah. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to a dishonorable passion. For their women exchanged natural relations to those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men, receiving to themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see it fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to be the base mind to do what they ought not to be doing, or in past tense, be done. They're filled with a manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, and they are gossips. They're slanders. They're haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, investors of evil. Inventors of evil, excuse me. Disobedient to their parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to, what's it say? Die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I'm going to pause for a second before I go to 1 Corinthians. Did you see your culture today, or did you hear your culture today as I read it? But what you didn't hear is tolerate it. Did you? 
We saw a perfectly painted image of what they are lusting and whoring after and what is the outcome of it poured out in Scriptures. We honor the Scriptures in all of our preaching and teaching. All of them. I don't know if you, you've seen the news in the past few weeks, but before the election, about two weeks before the election, I think I've said this, I know I said it in Radical Manhood, Toyota came out with a, uh, a position paper. They have positioned themselves not to be supporters of diversity, inclusivity training any longer. They're not advocates for or doing anything to monetarily give to any organization that is supporting any of the alphabet characters. They're bolder than we are in Christ. We're told we have to be accepting of all people. I'm going to tell you today, we have to be truth bearers before our, all people, or they will surely what? Die in their sins. My emotion as I sang this morning was out of these three words. Four? Can't count? Yeah, A is a word. Character too. The argument there. Make me a vessel, Lord. Make me a vessel. And if you know me at all, I got a pretty wide lid in my vessel. And I can make lists of men where I didn't want to go for four weeks that are texting and calling me today, this morning, you're making it home. How are you doing that I didn't know a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago? that they saw on the back of that computer. What in the heck? And why is the R backwards? Because sometimes life gets a little backwards. Oh man, that's me. And we get to pour out of being a vessel unto them. If we tolerate sin, what are we not doing? We're not preaching the gospel anymore. We're accepting their sinfulness as okay and not delivering truth that's going to stand right in the face of it where we recognize Romans is telling us that they have been given over to their sinfulness. I apologize. None of this is in my notes. And we got a lot of notes. Let me go with you to 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 19. Or do you not know that the unrighteousness, they will inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexual immoral, nor our idolaters, nor haters, nor men who practice homosexuality. No more homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you're washed. You're sanctified. You've become justified by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So therefore, flee all sexual immorality. All things are lawful to me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Run from it. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual immorality, that person's sin is against his own body. Or, get this, verse 19, if you you haven't heard anything, hear this. And hopefully this is a, a presuppositional place that you live out of. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you are or have from God? Brother and sister, hear me say this. I wrestle with this. And I surrendered to it decades ago. You are not your own if you name Christ. You're not. So when somebody asks you this question, so what do you want to do? 
And you're like, well, I'd like to do this. What key thing are you missing? God, what is your will for me today? And what do you have for me to do that I'm not having my eyes open to? Make it loud. Make it clear. Things change then. Joy comes poured out of different faucets in different volumes in different measures. And you stand before the Lord and you're like, what in the world just happened? I told you moments ago, I, I went to Michigan early before Radical Man because I don't get to spend time with my son. So I went a day early, and he, for some reason, has the same loves I do. He's my son. But he's better at some of the things than I am. So he's like, Dad, I know you're going out west to go duck hunting, so uh, I'm going to take you where I like to go here. Okay, let's go. I already got my stuff. I have Ellie here back home who's sick and not doing well and struggling with doctor visits on doctor visits on doctor visits. I get done with radical manhood in Detroit, and I'm like, just go home. I called Keith. I said, do I just need to come home? She's like, no. God's got bigger plans for you to go pour out. Those are her words. Go pour out into others. So I head west. To a man who's been a client of mine and now become a great friend and a, a brother in the faith, to work with him for three weeks straight. I'm just going to come. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to work with you. I'm going to do stuff for you. And the Lord then marches. Get this. My prayer on the journey is, Lord, magnify your reach to put me before men that sit with men. A gentleman comes into his lodge and looks around. She's talking to him and he goes, who does all this photography for you? And my friend Brad's a character and a half. He goes, oh, some real jerk from, from Michigan. He lives in that state up north. That's how you would have said it. And he goes on and on. And the gentleman standing right beside me that has greeted me has no idea that I'm the photographer. And he goes, well, I don't care what kind of jerk he is. I need him. I need his help. And Brad goes, well, be careful how you agree with me right now because you're standing right beside him. And I just kind of laugh. But the prayer is, Lord, put me before men that will magnify you before more men. This gentleman looks at me, and for some of you men that understand this organization, you'll, you'll understand the shock and awe of it. I have come into the town, the CEO of Delta Waterfowl and three of his chairmen. I need you to hang out with us for four days. The CEO of Delta Waterfowl leads men, if you don't know, almost in, well, he does lead men in every state and women too, both and influences them in conservation and how we handle and manage wildlife across North America. So a man that's not tied to one man, a man that's not tied to a hundred men, a man that's tied to literally tens of thousands of men. And the Lord says, Matt, I need you to hang out with us for four or five days. It's turned into seven. Make me an offering, Lord. But let me be pure and true so that your word can be true so that others are helped. So in this sermon, we understand the first of these points is God's vision to love and the human heart. It starts with the character of emphasizing his holiness and love. If you've been with us through the study of creation, fall, redemption, confirmation, why the Bible, we understand it starts where he had this intimate relationship rooted in commitment with Adam and Eve, rooted in holiness anchored in reflection of relationship of divine with human. But we, in our human desire, created brokenness. And Eve's decision, she chose to go whoring after that, being more like God and knowing more than God. It's not possible. But thinking that she could and then committing sins that created a fall for all of us. So we recognize God's character is es essence in His holy love an intentional relationship with each of us. There's an echo then of that in you to somebody else. Do you live with intentional relationship that others can have the hope that you have hidden within you for transformation from their lostness to found? We recognize that human desire and brokenness create then within us this distortion of your and our view of God and a distorted vision of who God is. Back in Corinthians, they said a word that's similar to this. 
Are you buying the deceit of the world around you? A spirit of deception. Do we know who offers the spirit of deception? Satan's whispers in your ears. Do you know that Satan cannot force you to be deceived? The whispers of Satan, because he's not God, he's not all-powerful. He brings them to you to tempt you to start to think about them and then to doubt things and to have disbelief and then to have a train wreck of your life because you bought the four Ds. And you've landed in discouragement and depression. This morning we're calling each other back to God's vision. One of grace that calls us to understand His original vision. We get then this bigger picture. The story of the Canada text is written so that we can understand God is calling me back to Himself with an audience of brothers and sisters that gather with us every day on Sunday and worship together. So the second thing we have going is God's design for humanity's drift. Do you ever feel like you've drifted from your moorings of where you're supposed to be? Be honest. Do you have good days? Raise your hand if you have good days sometimes. Then raise your hand if you have bad days sometimes. How did I ever make the swing from the good day to the bad day? Some of you guys never have days, apparently, because your hand didn't go up for either. Yeah, when you go like this, I got both, now I'm worshiping. I just realized that. What we need to understand is that when Satan is whispered in our ear and we're suppressing the truth like Romans 1 speaks of, we are now opening ourselves to all kinds of lies that are only going to destroy you and I. Coming at us like fiery darts, we're thinking, no, that's a water hose. That's a squirt gun. That's nothing. Instead, we don't realize the decay that's happening. So Romans helps us see and understand it, it wears away at God's existence and His order in our own mind, and we begin redefining love, and even in the case of the text, sexuality and what that looks like to where you get to where our culture is today. It's really messed up. And we all know that if you visit a Walmart in any town, you get a snapshot of that culture. Right? Can be with me? The Wichita Mountain Range of Oklahoma is a really interesting Walmart visit, by the way. I literally stood in line and I'm like, trying not to be obvious, but I'm like, I have no idea what's ringing me out. I have no idea. That our culture has bought Satan's deception so deep that I don't want to be man or woman, I just want to be. Then what are you? The only thing I can land is certainly deceived and confused by Satan. So sad. It was a dude, I could tell, because he's like 18 feet taller than I was, unless it was the world's largest, tallest woman. Okay, so I could tell it was a male, but he didn't know he's a male, apparently. Satan is whispering these lies, and he's like, Matt, but that doesn't apply to me. What small lie does, though? What small whisper of deception is there? I talked to enough of you men to, to know you struggle with. Sometimes I don't feel that I'm good enough for my family that I'm providing as I should, that I'm leading as I should, that I'm the best father I can be to my kids. And Satan starts to chirp at that and erode that and say, yeah, you suck, Dad. You're really bad at this. You're not good at this. And then your whole demeanor changes. Every one of us needs to understand when a spirit of deception is chirping, you can fight back and say, not today, Satan. Just like Christ has done when, when Peter, of all people, he had to say it to you. His biggest ally and fan and apostle. He had to say, get behind me. That is not truth for me. Do you and I do that? When we exchange the truth for the lie, this distortion of desire and purpose creeps in. Radical manhood is all about establishing purpose in men's life based on capital H, His purpose, God's purpose for our living. Paul describes this not merely as wrong choices, but a severe departure from truth. Severe departure. That word exchange, exchange love and sexuality, they lose their intended meaning. The consequences of misplaced worship lead to disorder and separation. So what if I believe this? So what if I support this? You're standing on the edge of a cliff that is undercut by the flow of water underneath you of lies, and sooner or later, you're 
cliff is going to cave in. And you'll be swept away. Only you have the authority to say to yourself, that is the spirit of deception. Satan, get out of my mind. What we do take away from this text is Paul highlights that our bodies are not made to be subject of worship or instruments of selfish pleasure. Get that. They're intended for worship. You are created in the image of God to be a worshiper of the one true God, restored back to Him because of the, the death that Christ lived. That's the thing that you can point to people. That's the hope you can give people. Hope of the Lord. Do you guys have people in your lives that demonstrate that they are somewhat hopeless? You all need to make a list of those people. And we can sing fully what we sang in the beginning of this sermon. Make me an offering poured out before people. Just pour it out, pour it out, pour it out, pour it out. We need to be ones that understand being called back to God's design. The third slide this morning is understanding that sexual integrity and the body are absolutely sacred in 1 Corinthians. The body's purpose is, what Paul's teaching us here, is that it's the temple of the Lord. The Spirit resides in us, created to honor God. While I was, while I was gone and in some off time between writing a sermon in my off time and doing some uh, other work for other clients while I'm still out working for clients but in breaks, uh, I was designing a graphic for myself. What it looks like to be a fisher of men in a graphic. I'm a graphic designer and photographer. Maybe you guys have that. Well, somebody asked me this earlier. Where's your photography when you see it? I don't really show it to people anymore except for clients. Because it's not about me. This graphic I made was anchored on the word abide. Am I allowing myself to be held by God in the cleft of His protection? Or am I doing life myself? I say that for you and I to recognize that takes surrender. We then gain unity with Christ when we surrender. Sexual purity isn't only the refraining from certain acts, but it's understanding that we are united with Christ as we remain pure. Our bodies are members of His body. Like, that's not fair. I didn't ask for that. No, but you've inherited it. Your great uncle might pass away and some attorney calls you someday and says, I have a letter here that says you're to receive $1.6 million. And I said, I didn't ask that. I got one condition in my mind of how you're going to receive it. Really? Is there anybody that's like, oh, just like, you, you, know, you must have the wrong name. Understand that in your faith, you have been given newness of life, and now in that you get to glorify God in your body. And Paul encourages the believer, glorify God in such a way that it honors God and is reminding the world around you that you understand you're bought with a price. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So our, our purpose of our bodies is to be temples for the Holy Spirit. Paul reminds us, in, again in 1 Corinthians 6, emphasizing the divine purpose of your body, describing them. Get this, you might not like it. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit. How do I treat it? What do I put into it? Do I exercise it? Do I love it? Do I make it last or work to make it last longer? so that God can be more magnified through my voice to other people to see His name? This teaching invites you and I to a way deeper understanding. But it's anchored in understanding that we are created to honor God above all things. In that, we are then joined with Christ and we have unity reflecting our relationship with, with Him. Paul's echoing this and his teaching here is very revolutionary for the time. It shows that our spiritual life cannot be separated from our physical actions. That's when we would hear this statement said to him. That's not very Christian. Anybody hear that word ever said that way? I hate it, by the way. Like, that's not very Christian. Let's just call it what it is. That action was not like Christ. That makes sense? I hate the plurality of Christian that what you just did didn't look anything like what Jesus would have done. And then I have to ask myself, well, that's true. It wasn't. When we approach understanding oneness with Christ, we then demonstrate a sacrificial love that He demonstrated to us. And we recognize, we're saying to the world, we belong to Him and are loved by Him. 
and He desires for us to live in Him and reflect His love to other people. I'll say a quote I've said probably 50 times from this platform. Love is the overflow of joy you have in Christ that meets other people's needs. That's all it is. Do you evidence any of that love? It's Ohio, so you don't find Verner's very easy, but ginger ale, Verner's ginger ale. Anybody know Verner's ginger ale? What happens if you like pour it and you like just breathe around it? <coughs> you, you do. You like choke up. Does the volume of your life bleed out to impact others just by breathing with them? A few months ago, we talked about the fragrance of Christ resonating off of you. Do you you smell like Christ? The fourth thing this morning is this. Living out God's love through purity and freedom. You're like, well, that doesn't make sense. When you are fleeing sexual immorality, you look different than the world around us. When we have freedoms in Christ, we emphasize then Christ's boundaries are there to protect our freedoms. They're not limiting our freedoms. I've literally had men say to me, your life must be boring, Matt. (laughs) You ought to hang out with me for a few moments. It's anything but boring. But it is anchored in Christ's righteousness. You and I are empowered by the Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit, we are empowered to live out what we call purity. Our strength doesn't come from ourselves, but it comes from the desire to be and abide with Christ. So a couple takeaway points here. Are you and I fleeing sexual immorality? Are there things that you have up in your life as protections? Paul instructs us to flee sexual immorality. He hasn't then issued this ruling of a mere uh, measuring of that restriction but He wants you and I to understand the unique effect of spiritual decay because of sexual decay. The erosion that takes place. By encouraging us to flee sexual immorality, Paul is pointing us toward a path that is one of preservation and, get this with a W, wholeness. Not holy, like the movement holiness, but completeness. So in this, we gain freedom through Christ and the boundaries that are liberated. The boundaries that tie you down, the things that you have as what I label as artificial or limiting beliefs. Somebody has told you at some point that you're worthless. You're not good for much. You're not very smart. You're not very fast. Whatever it is. Has anybody ever had somebody tell you something that's limiting of you? Let's be honest. My mother one time, you're, you're going to laugh at this. Maybe you'll agree. I don't know. My mother went to a ninth grade parent-teacher conference, and my mom has her master's degree as an ed specialist and is a teacher also, but not in that school district that teacher didn't know. My mom sat across from that teacher and goes, you know that your son's retarded. That word was acceptable back in the 90s. And my mother said, excuse me? And pushed back, maybe you just don't know how to educate all students. Was I a trouble student? No. Was I a willful student? Oh, yeah. What we need to understand then is what is God setting us free from? Has that limiting belief defined me? Obviously, my mom came home and asked me, what in the world do you do in that classroom? How do you behave? How do you act? Who sits around you? She's that smart. Who's influencing you? Then she went to this. Is there a cute girl near you? Actually, Mary Gundy sits right in front of me. Oh, let's move your chair. Watch this. The retardation will go away. Do you think I think about what that teacher said to my mom in any way today still? Yeah, because that was of you. I had a guidance counselor say to me as I turned in a application, four applications to colleges, why in the world are you filling out a college application? Do you think that empowered me at all? Absolutely. I went back to that guidance counselor because I'm now a track coach in that school district. And I said to her, by the way, you destroyed my life with one quote of a statement. And by the way, I graduated in three years. 
with a degree all the way into what would be a Bachelor of Fine Arts, which is a master's degree level. Maybe you don't know what I love. And it definitely wasn't Algebra 3, Trigonometry, whatever. I know it's only Algebra 2, I'm so missing some. But what limiting beliefs is the world speaking to you that you've bought the lie and deception and now erosion is taking place and we don't stand before anymore and say living out God's love through these things. So this morning I I pray that this sermon and this application helps us walk in love with integrity that the world looks at you and says you are weird. You're different. You're unique. That was the crescendo of my past four weeks. I was supposed to be done out west two days ago, and one of the guides says to me, is there any chance you can come with me tomorrow morning? I got something for you tonight to go do. I'm like, dude, I already know you. He is the one that asked what's radical manhood on the back of my computer. He goes, I got somewhere for you and I go tomorrow morning. And there's a couple other guys going to meet us. Driving out there, he looks at me and goes, I need your help big time. I've lost my home. I've lost my family. I don't know how to say no. But I think I need your help. And I looked at him and said, you don't need my help. You need Christ giving you his help. And that's my prayer for you and I. Is that we recognize we hold the treasure that literally sets other people free. And I was arguing with God four weeks earlier, like, why am I leaving my family to go do this? May you and I understand the fullness of what God's doing in our lives when we do offer ourselves some self-reflection on the choices we make. When we ask ourselves, am I willing to be held accountable in a community of believers? And the last is this. This is next month's topic for radical manhood. Do I, do I exercise gratitude for grace? I've been hanging out with boys from South Carolina and Louisiana. Their little twins just came out. Sorry, it's been there all week long. Do you and I live in such a way that we remind each other, our own congregation of God's grace to us? And live it. And go for it. Even when the world looks at you and you think, what are they going to think of me? That's a D word, by the way. That is a deceitful thought. What are they going to think of me? When the question should be, what is my God's view of me today? I'll give you an answer. Holy, righteous, and redeemed. He doesn't think anything other than that on your life. Nothing else. So when we offer self-reflection on our choices, we then find ourselves the ability to realign with God's purpose. When we can sit in accountability and community, we then come to a place where we find strength in shared journeys. When we understand a reflection of gratitude for God's grace, then we get this, the forgiveness that He offers us new beginnings every single day. Amen, right? But but Matt, if you only knew my heart, I would say the same thing to you. If I did literally know your heart and thought right now, I would say to you, He does offer to you again today another new beginning. That's the same thing I said to Zach in his truck. Dude, don't let your past define you. Let God's view of you catapult you forward instead of looking at your past. So this morning, I'd ask this in final thought, that you start to begin to embrace a life that is honoring to God every hour of every day. Don't think conditionally, no one's around, so I can have you know my four fingers of whiskey at night, no one's looking, and then all of a sudden, I'm, at, I'm actually on my fifth one. Fernando Ortega says, says it the best. When I am alone, what am I saying and being? What am I doing? When I'm in an audience, it's easy. I'll make great choices. But the whispering deceptions lead us astray. The thing that we have to focus on to carry this all through is this. It's Christ's redemptive love for us. And I get to choose today who I serve. I'm going to say, Satan, get behind me. God before me. I want my life to honor you because you've made a sacrifice for me that I didn't even do. Let me pray for you.
Lord, I pray that you'd allow us what, to understand what surrender really is. Letting go of me and my kind of language. And saying, Lord, where do you want me? Lord, when we can surrender to you, we recognize that our lives are dedicated to something totally different than our own self-pleasure. When we live a, a love for you, we recognize that it's a love that you've given to us first. And Lord, we do pray that our cup overflows with it because that's the only way someone will come in contact with it. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that gathered with me this morning. They would recognize that their relationship to God is magnified. When we say to Satan, get out of my head, that is not true. That is not right. That is not good for me. Lord, I pray that you would help us each in the hearing of this understand this is worship that aligns us with your purpose. It definitely brings an experience to us that does offer to us a peace that maybe we've never had before. Lord, I pray for my friends that have gathered that they can walk in confidence of your love for us, for them. Lord, that we can follow a path that you've given, not just to be followers on a path, but understand you've given us a trajectory to enjoy life with integrity and joy that is an evident light that shines out of that that says, this is who God is. So Lord, I pray that we'd honor you, that we'd love you, that we would leave this room as a congregation, not just inspired, but motivated and encouraged to live out God's vision in the lives that we have relationships with outside of this place. Lord, I pray that you'd help us hear this, not just hear it as a Sunday morning entertainment model, but to be transformed by it because you are that big. Lord, for the friend that sits and they have already got limiting beliefs chirping into them, like, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, Lord, I pray that you'd give them the courage right now to say it. Satan, get out of my head. Get behind me. Lord, before me, may I endure the cross and live for the King. And again, Together, all God's people said,